Lindsay. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I think one of the best things about being on the second day is that I feel like I've already met so many of you and I feel like I'm amongst friends. So <laughs> it's a room of 400 of my closest friends. Also, because I am super type A, anal retentive, the ruler is my brand archetype um, that I found out yesterday, I'm going to be doing my own slides. So we'll, we shall see if it works. Do we have any musical theater fans? <laughs> Yay, yes, Parker, Jordan, who I met last night. Um, the reason I bring that up is that I love musical theater, and my daughter is a huge musical theater fan. So we have a tradition on Friday nights where my daughter is nine and my son is four, and we put him to bed, so hashtag second child, right? <laughs> Sorry, Colin, put him to bed, and then we pop some popcorn and watch a movie. The challenge that we often face is to find movies that are age appropriate for her, but still interesting enough for me to watch. So my mother suggested, why not watch West Side Story? You're both super into you know, musical theater, and it's kind of a timeless tale. And I thought, well, you know, I love the musical. If you don't know the musical, it's from 1957, hugely popular. It's a modern day, you know, 1950s, Romeo and Juliet. And it's a story of Tony and Maria, star-crossed lovers, in New York City in the 50s. And the movie is from 1961. So my daughter, you know, she's nine and a half. So she is very fidgety. She will not sit still. She fidgets with the blanket. She fidgets with the popcorn. She goes and gets more food. She asks a million questions every time we watch a movie together. So I thought, I'm not so sure if this movie is going to resonate with her. What I found was that she was completely transfixed from start to finish, from the first note to the last note when we, of course, held each other sobbing. <laughs> um, and it, what I, well, I bring this up to say that it's not about the medium, it's about the message. So when we talk about digital storytelling, people get very hung up on, is digital better than direct mail, which is a stupid question, first of all. Um, one is not better than the other. But the medium is not as important as the message. If you have a timeless, wonderful, universally themed, inspiring, compelling story, it doesn't matter where you tell it. So today, we are going to talk about the medium as well as the message. Yuval Harari wrote in Sapiens, which is a fantastic must-read book, and I see Brendan shaking his head over there. Yes, read this book. He found that language was actually not created to form battle plans and to help us figure out where we're going to you know, put our next cave or where we're going to kill our next saber-toothed tiger, or I know that we weren't around with saber-toothed tigers, but um, it was created to tell stories, and it was created to help humans relate to one another and comfort each other and build social connections. Um, the stories that resonate with us help us define our worldview. So these are four of my favorite books. Asking me to choose my favorite book is like asking, it's like Sophie's Choice. You can't choose a favorite book of all time. Probably it's Harriet the Spy, though, if I had to say. <laughs> so these, you can already tell a lot about me by these books. The stories that resonate with us you can tell a lot about a person. You can tell a lot about your audience. You can tell a lot about your donors by the stories that resonate with them. And we talked a lot about donor retention. These are my two kids, it's Isabel and Colin. The other great thing about stories is that they make unpalatable ideas palatable. So show of hands, who loves the Berenstein Bears? Everybody, that's so great. I love the Berenstein Bears. They're completely timeless. These are the, my kids' two favorite books. Trouble at School, which is where brother lies about failing a test, and he, you know, he makes um, a paper airplane, and he flies it, and he loses it, and he doesn't tell his parents, and he gets in trouble. And the second one is about brother and sister refusing to clean their room, and the mom basically losing her shit, right? Really. <laughs> we can all res we can, that all resonates with us. But my kids love these stories, even though they're basically lecturing them <laughs> and saying, if you don't clean your room, 
mama is going to come in and put everything in a box and throw it away, which is, is, has happened to us several times. So it, stories help bring new ideas to audiences that may not be as receptive to them. It helps open up the receptors in our brain. Storytelling has been proven scientifically to create pathways in the brain and to help introduce us to new things that we may not have actually thought about before. Not only that, stories help us remember things. They help us remember the feeling that we have when we hear the story much more than we remember statistics and data. And we've talked about a lot about this throughout the conference. I feel like storytelling is kind of a theme. So what I'm going to talk about today is how storytelling makes up the DNA of your organization. It makes up the DNA of your organization and it connects the dots for your supporters, your donors, your stakeholders, for people that are interested in the cause. So we can't think of one story to rule them all. We have to start thinking about digital storing especially, digital storytelling especially, as breadcrumbs leading us to the bigger picture of the organization. Think about a big connect the dots with all of your little breadcrumbs helping connect the dots, all of the stories that you tell. So I want you to go to slido.com. Some of you have already done this, and we're gonna look at this later, and type in L360. And I wanna know from you, that some, there's already some fantastic answers in there, but I want to know from you, what makes a story? And there's, you won't be quizzed on this later. There's no right or right, wrong or right answer. But to you, what makes a story? So take a second, go to slido.com, type in L360, and answer the question. And we'll look at those, we'll look at those a little bit later. One of the most important things that you can do when you're building your digital communities, when you are sharing stories across multiple channels, is think of it like building up a tribe. So Seth Godin wrote a fantastic book, and we talk a lot about Seth Godin. I talk a lot about Seth Godin in a lot of my presentations. But he talked about finding people that care about what you do and shunning the non-believers. And I completely believe in that. So your stories are helping build that community of passionate believers. And I should be able, when I look at your donor communications, like those fantastic examples that Rachel showed, you know, if someone's gonna get offended by saying half-ass, no, not half-ass, whole-ass grown-up, then that, that's not, they're not your people, okay? They're not, it's not going to resonate with them. It doesn't have to resonate with everybody. But I should be able to look at it and say, people like me do things like this. This reflects my values, this reflects my worldview, this reflects my ethics, this reflects what I think about. The goal of your digital storytelling should be to create a shared value, or shared, sorry, identity with your audience. You want to create a shared identity. You want your donors and your supporters to think of you as part of the fabric of who they are. And I think Stephen shared some fantastic examples. A great example of that would be when Stephen shared the Buzzards Bay example. Buzzards Bay is part of his identity. He grew up there. His family vacations there. He wants to leave a bequest in his will to save Buzzards Bay. Think about your donors and think about how you can tell these kinds of stories that are gonna help create this shared identity with your cause over time. So a lot of us have serious problems getting buy-in for our storytelling efforts, let alone our digital storytelling efforts at our organizations. I encourage you to poll your donors, to survey your donors, to talk to your donors, call them on the phone, it doesn't have to be digital. But what you're gonna find is that they want and crave these kinds of stories. So Stephen shared a lot about the donor retention data. This is another study that was done where Blackbaud asked thousands of donors, what kind of communications do you want to receive from the causes you support? 
So some people want news, some people want campaign goal progress, some people want upcoming events, most people want stories. So by the way, this is your digital content strategy right there. If you ever wanna know how many stories should we tell versus how much news versus how many announcements. This is a really great benchmark for you. Also, it's important that the communications we share actually reflect what our donors want to hear from us. This Venn diagram um, is from Mark Phillips, Blue Frog Fundraising. And I think that everyone needs to sort of put it up on their wall, at least every development slash marketing person. And I should say that um, I come from the development marketing world. So I was in the Peace Corps, and then I came home and I was a development director at a university, and then I was one of those development slash marketing directors, which I think a lot of you are in this room. And I completely agree with the difference between fundraising and marketing, but I know that we're struggling to get the word out. We're struggling to increase visibility. We're struggling to get more people on board. We're struggling not to become the best kept secret, even though I know we're not supposed to say that. So think about shifting your communications priorities and your messages. <laughs> this is not my car. This is just a photo from Google Images of a car. The way you th can think about creating these passionate supporters, th ask yourself, would your donors put a bumper sticker on their car? Would they put a sticker on their laptop? Now this is really important because bumper stickers and stickers in general, they send a signal to other people. So you can see the stickers on my laptop. Who do I have? Do I have any nonprofits? I have eight of the human rights campaign. I have N10. I have a Doctor Who sticker, <laughs> a unicorn. But you can, it it's a, sends a signal to you. So when you see that, if you also support the human rights campaign, it sends a signal to you that I'm one of you. I'm one of your people. And if you don't support the human rights campaign, you may or may not want to talk to me about it. It doesn't it doesn't preclude us from having a conversation, but it sends a signal. It invites people in and it also lets people know publicly what you stand for. So would your donors be willing to send this kind of signal to their network, to their friends, to their family? Would they be willing to change their Facebook page cover photo over to your organization's logo for a day? That's the kind of inspiration that we want to elicit. That's, that's the kind of passion that we want to um, inspire. So we need, we need help doing this, right? Who, who does digital storytelling perfectly? Other than maybe Brandon back there. <laughs> Even he didn't raise his hand. No one does it perfectly. It, the, the key with digital storytelling is that it's constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. I loved Rachel's presentation, and I'm glad that it came before mine, because it's so important to have fun and to be lighthearted and to experiment. This is not brain surgery. You put something up on Facebook and it doesn't get any clicks. Nobody dies. This is not NASA, right? So taking risks, I love that it came before. I love that she was talking about taking risks because I think that's important. We need to completely shift our mindset around storytelling, also around donor communications. We need to stop thinking about it as a megaphone, and we need to stop treating digital channels as billboards and as this one-way street, this one-way megaphone to push out our agenda. We need to think about it as building a community, as creating value, sharing insight, and actually think about it as a gift for our supporters. That's a total mindset shift. So we're gonna talk about the five essential building blocks of compelling stories. We're gonna watch a couple of videos and then we'll talk about how we can best spread these stories out to our audience. Okay, so let's see what we said about what makes a story. This is a neat little app I have called Slido. It's completely free. So what makes a story? A story inspires change either in ourselves or in others. I love that. A narrative bringing the reader or listener on a journey through a character who encounters conflict, vision, experience, communication. And if you go to this, you can see all the results, because I don't think I can show them all to you on the screen. 
an emotional hook, a narrative structure, a journey. From the crucifixion of Christ to the revenge of the Sith, every story ever is not a story without problems. A life change. That is really cool. Thank you for sharing. You can still share through the end of the day. Um, and I'll be publishing those, all the, the results up on my blog. There's no right or wrong answer to what a story is. Stories are objective. But there are essential building blocks to compelling stories. Okay, So not every story is going to be created equal. And what looks like a story to you might not look like a story to me. But there is kind of a right answer in the way to structure your stories. So there are some essential building blocks. So what are they? One is a compelling character. Human brains are not wired to be able to process information about mass suffering. So you can tell me about the millions of refugees that need to be resettled. Or you can tell me a story of one person's journey, one family's journey. So the compelling character. Now this can be a staff member, a board member, a donor, a community member, a partner, but it needs to be compelling, it needs to be interesting. There needs to be some charisma. There needs to be some way that this story is going to resonate with me. Um, so Doorways for Women and Families, what I like that they do is that they tell stories. Not all their stories have a happy ending, but they tell stories knowing that the one story is not going to represent every single story. Like I said before, they're breadcrumbs, they're dots that will help connect the dots about your organization. If you have multiple departments and multiple programs and multiple services that you provide, we all have multiple audiences that we need to reach. One story is not going to do all of that for you, but that shouldn't prevent you from collecting and telling the story. You also can incorporate data into the story. What, why now? What's the urgency? Why are you telling the story? Is this really a problem? I don't know. So you can put some data and statistics into the story to make it a little bit more compelling, a little bit more urgent and timely and relevant. Make sure that you don't make your organization the hero of the story. So I have a kind of controversial opinion about donor worship. I think we should be donor centric, yes. I think we should have what, thank our donors. I think we should focus on donor retention. But I don't think the donor is the hero of the story. So, oh, and also, so I got in kind of a Twitter back and forth <laughs> with some fundraisers on this, and one of them was Mark Pittman, and he said to say hello to everybody. So hello, everyone, from Mark Pittman. But he thinks the donor is the hero of the story. I think the client is the hero of the story. I think the organization is the guide, kind of like Yoda or Haymitch in The Hunger Games. And I think the donor makes the journey possible. So that's, that's really my viewpoint. The point being, whether it's the donor, whether it's the client, it's not the organization. <laughs> Don't make your organization the hero of the story. Look at the framework of these two titles of the video. You know, how doorways for women and families help sa save Leela's life or how Leela's life was transformed and she got back on her feet really important that we don't focus on the features of what happened, but we focus on the benefits of the work that we did. So this is Helen. This is also Charity Water, and I'm going to tell her story. So Charity Water went to, um, they went to the Ivory Coast, and they built some wells. They built a, a ton of wells, actually. But what really gets me about the storytelling that they do is that they don't focus on clean water. They focus on the universal themes of integrity and dignity and beauty. So this is Helen. One of the Charity Water representatives went to her village to interview her and she said, I'm happy now. I have time to eat. My children can go to school and I can even work in my garden, take a shower and then come back for more water if I want. I'm bathing so well. So of course, some of the men in the village laughed because she was talking publicly about bathing. And the charity water representative just touched her arm and said, 
that is so wonderful. Like, you know, that, that's really, really nice. And Helen turned to her and said, now I am beautiful. Now I'm beautiful. So Charity Water is giving the gift of beauty. It's giving the gift of dignity. It's not necessarily giving the gift of water. I think that in all of their communications, they always focus on these universal themes that we can all understand. We can all understand wanting to feel beautiful. This is the Greater Boston Food Bank, where I live, very small organization, does great work. They focus on stories that are relatable. Those kinds of stories where you really feel like you, this could be you. We're all one bad medical diagnosis, one crisis, one stroke of bad luck away from needing the services that we provide. So tell stories about people that are relatable. These are actual, uh, it's an actual family in my community that I could easily run into in the grocery store. I mean, they're very courageous and very brave for telling their story so publicly. And that's certainly not going to be the case for every single client will not want to do that. But the relatable, this could be me structure of a story works, works really, really well. Asking people to put themselves in your client's shoes. Imagine if, imagine if. Then walking them through what that might look like. Also, details. And Shannon talked about this too. What did it look like? What did it smell like? This one, the detail in this that the chill cut to the bone. He talks about his fingers were frozen. He talks about what it felt like to be homeless, the kinds of looks that he got, the kinds of remarks. So how did it feel? How did it smell? How did it sound? Details. New York City Homeless Relief. They're, they start their stories off kind of with like a gut punch. So this is a, a, actually a five minute video that we're not gonna watch, but I'm happy to send you the link. They start off not with a logo. They don't start off the video with the executive director saying, Hi, I'm the executive director. I'm so happy you're watching this video. They start the video off with a gentleman talking about how he smelled so badly that no one would sit next to him on the subway. So you immediately are, are drawn in. You get this sensation of what that must have smelled like. And you probably think about a time when maybe you moved on the subway or maybe you sidestepped um, a homeless person. So you, you're really brought into the experience with those details, so that kind of language. Oops. If you have confidentiality problems, and we, we're gonna watch this video, I really recommend using either avatars or, or animation, if that's possible, but telling, still being able to tell a story of one individual. This is Feeding America, and I'm gonna hope that this will work.
So first of all, I love that they s talked about you because what's the donor's favorite word? It's you <laughs> to hear. Uh, what's anyone's favorite word? It's their name and you. But it grabbed your attention by telling that sort of universal story that we can all relate to. And then it hit you with the data. And then it asked you to be a part of the solution. So that's really a perfect example. But if you have client confidentiality issues, um, then I encourage you to you know, think through ways that you can use animation throughout your website, throughout your social media sites. There's also, without using animation, you can use stock photography. So this is Amira Incorporated. They are an organization in New England that helps sex trafficking survivors. And I never knew that sex trafficking was such a gigantic problem in my own backyard. So that kind of shocked me. But what they do on social media is they're very careful not to be exploitative. They do ethical storytelling in a fantastic way, but they show the backs of heads, they show fields, they show streams, they show photos of the emotion that they want to evoke with the story. Everything that they do is supposed to be evoking a sense of calm, a sense of belonging, a sense of home, a sense that chaos is over and everything is okay. So follow, these are all screenshots from my phone. I hope you can see that. So I'm like Rachel. <laughs> I take social media screenshots and just completely, my whole desktop, my whole phone, everything that I own, every piece of digital equipment I own is just full of screenshots of social media storytelling that I like. So we're gonna, we'll look at some today. The second building block is trajectory. Trajectory means that something has to happen. So I don't think that it means everything has to be tied up in a happy bow at the end. I think trajectory just means that a donor could be part of the solution, part of writing that happy ending. So this is Makita. She is a guest at Rosie's Place in Boston, a small organization in Boston. And she tells her story of being the middle child of 10, getting married when she was 20. She had two kids by the time she was 23. She suffered really horrifically crippling postpartum depression, went through a divorce, ended up homeless and addicted to drugs. And then she was found in the parking lot of Rosie's place. And a social worker talked to her. And the, what I thought was really compelling about her story is not that she said, the social worker saved me and the organization saved me. She said, I thank the social worker because she empowered me to want to make a change. She asked me if I needed help, and that helped me learn that I could ask for help. That helped me learn that I could ask for help. So thinking about your organization as the guide and not the hero. Telling stories about your founders, telling stories about the staff members, that works incredibly well. You can tell stories, you can repurpose these stories across all of the different channels, but rather than just sharing a link to an article and saying, hey, read this article, telling a little bit of the story behind that article. Why is it important? This is what we tend to do. We tend to say client X was here, our organization came in, and now client X is fine. But this story structure does not grab attention anymore. The story structure does not pique curiosity. We've heard it before, it's been done. It's certainly effective if you have everyone's complete attention maybe at your gala, but if you're fighting for attention on social media, if you're fighting for attention on YouTube, you need to start in the middle. You need to change up the story structure. You need to experiment with unexpected narratives and characters that you might not have thought could work. You also should be revisiting your stories. So this is Helen. They revisited her story seven years later. You have these stories. You, if your organization has been around, you probably have been telling at least a few stories, a handful of stories, revisit them. Make sure that the audience knows that this is an ongoing journey. It doesn't end. For anyone that works in homelessness or violence or poverty, it doesn't end when the client walks out the door. We know that there are a myriad of challenges that are faced, but invite us in, show us the trajectory, show us what happened even after 
the client left our organization. Authenticity is vital. This is the, is this the second or the third? The third building block. Um, and by authenticity, I mean emotional resonance. You need to be authentic to your audience. So if, you're at, if you ask me, what kind of emotion should I be evoking in my stories? I can't tell you. I don't know what would work for your audience and your particular donors. Some things that work for some organizations might not work for others. So we all know the Sarah McLachlan commercial. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to play it for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're just going to watch that for the next half an hour. So if you don't know about the Sarah McLachlan commercial, does any, I don't remember the organization. The ASPCA. The ASPCA, okay. I knew it had to do the animals. It's Sarah McLachlan looking very sad with abused, pictures of horrifically abused animals and arms of the angel playing. And it's, it's a, when you first see it, it's incredibly effective, right? It makes them millions of dollars because they're counting on those people that haven't seen it yet. You can't build a long-term relationship with a donor by sharing that over and over. There's memes about it. There are memes about this. Share, like continually pulling heartstrings like that, it's exhausting, it creates apathy, it creates compassion fatigue. So it might be initially effective to tell that kind of story that is gonna make everybody cry, but it's definitely not gonna help you build long-term relationships. Okay, I just wanna do a time check because I did wanna watch this video because I wanna make sure that you cry at least once during my presentation. <laughs> Um, this is, this is not a nonprofit, this is Google, but what I love about this particular video is that it shows us the potential of storytelling in terms of thinking about like a long-term vision. So let's see if we can play this. It's really good. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this. Yemai, ye Yusuf. लंगोटिया यार सी मेरा लाहौर में हम आ रहे करके सामने एक बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाबा आदम के जमाने रोज शाम को हमने वहाँ पतंगे उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यीशु के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते 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 मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली नमस्ते हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों जजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन की तंग गले फिर से कूद खाते छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ ले के बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह पार्टीशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए। तादो? यूसुफ जी बड़ी याद आती है। कागजों के कश्तियों में डूब रहे तक, झांकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहे तक।
हाँ जी कौन हैप्पी बर्थडे यार love about that video is that it does pull at the heartstrings, but it's a story of hope and inspiration. And if you noticed, it didn't really say a word about Google, really. Google was inside of the ad, but it wasn't based, it wasn't saying, Google, this is what Google does. It wasn't um, highlighting the features of what Google does. It was highlighting the benefits. This is the vision. This is what's possible because of Google. Those are the kinds of stories we should be telling, ones that uplift, stories of hope, stories of inspiration, stories of what's possible because we exist. We don't need to tell people the nuts and bolts of what we do. We just need to show them that we are the guide on this client's journey. So I, I love that. Personal stories are the most powerful. Think about the stories that we've heard since we got here yesterday. Um, I'm just thinking of ones that I remember. Shannon's amazingly powerful personal story about when she entered foster care at nine years old. Brandon's story about moving, about starting a business, about his wife struggling with depression. Steven's story about Buzzards Bay and his family and going there on vacation. Those are the stories that you're gonna remember when this is long done. Now, there are some people that say, Telling client stories is unethical, that it's exploitative, that it's poverty porn, that it's, it's not something that we should be doing. I completely disagree. I think that we need to stop infantilizing our clients and we need to stop thinking that we automatically know what they want. We need to be protective of them. We need to completely honor their confidentiality and honor their journey and make them understand that this is just one piece of the journey. This is not the event that defines them. But if they want to come forward, helping explain that personal stories are by far the most powerful form of communication. So if anyone wants to have a debate with me afterwards, I'm happy to do that. You can also tell stories in your client's own words. Now, I say the word client. Rosie's place calls them guests. Some of you might call them members. So when I say client, I, you know, I'm, it's just the, the term that I'm most familiar with. This is the Cabrera School for Girls that I support in Ghana. They never really write these crazy thank you letters. They don't really write, um, do a huge blog. On social media, they post a great visual and they post a great quote straight from the girl's mouth. And that's the most powerful form of communication that we have. You can do it in the third person, you can do it in the first person. You know, St. Baldrick's Foundation, they take questions that they get all the time. So think about your frequently asked questions. Think about knowledge gaps. Think about myths and misconceptions that people might have. Think about what, just what, pe what are people asking you? They get this question all the time. What's it like to be a childhood cancer survivor? So they said, well, we'll just tell a story around it. We'll answer it in a story. Best Buddies does social listening like nobody's business. They mine the internet for any mention of Best Buddies. The mentors and mentees that participate in Best Buddies share all the time. They share all the time. This is a perfect story and a perfect example of the breadcrumbs that I was talking about. This is not a start to finish story. This is not this happened, this happened, this happened, and then this happened, and then there was a problem, and then it was solved. But it helps, it helps make you feel something. It helps connect you to the organization. And they share stories like this all the time that they take from other people sharing stories online. Another 
really vital piece of digital storytelling is the visual. So if you are sharing any kind of information on any kind of digital channel, you need a photo. You need a visual. So it could be a graphic that you create, but showing and not telling. This picture tells a story without me even reading the caption, but it draws me in, it grabs my attention, it makes me want to see what's going on in this photo and potentially how I can help. Another essential building block, inspire action. So we are not rational beings, right? I'm gonna go buy these boots at Nordstrom and then I'm gonna go home and feel bad, but I'm gonna say, nope, they were on sale. I got extra credit card points. They're gonna look great for work and after work. They are, you know, they match everything. So we make emotional decisions and we rationalize them, but nothing happens without emotion. Please don't get me all excited about your story and then do this. Like, don't have these crazy, non-specific calls to action to follow you on digital channels without explaining to me how it's going to help, how it's going to help me join a community. These calls to action, they don't inspire me, but they don't build any kind of community, right? So we need to bring people into the fold and really explain what we want them to do. We need to actively battle that compassion fatigue because that's what, does, that's, what, that's what people don't take action. We feel overwhelmed. There are so many negative messages coming at us constantly, and we feel hopeless. This is why people don't act on things like climate change and poverty and homelessness, but telling those personal stories can inspire action. Something like the number of children that are hungry in the summer because they don't receive school breakfast and lunch. So. Feeding America, they tell one story. They tell one story and they walk you through what it's like to be one of those children. And then they ask you to help save summer for kids. They don't say, like us on Facebook, get involved. They don't even say donate. They say, help us save summer for children. So weaving your calls to action within your story works really well and can be really effective. Hooking people. Do we have any journalism majors? Yay, journalism majors. Okay, so you already have an advantage because in the digital age, we have to think like journalists. We have to think what's gonna to get to the front page? What's going to capture our editor's attention? What's gonna capture our reader's attention? We have to hook people. I hate things like this, but I wanted to show it to you because I go to so many social media conferences where half of the talk is spent going over these statistics. Why does that help you? It does not help you. The number one question that I get is, how can I cut through the clutter? How can I yeah, cut through the clutter? That's the, that's the phrase. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it in two parts. One, you can't. And two, you shouldn't. So let me explain that. So number one, you absolutely cannot cut through this clutter. There's, there's no way. So that's a low value question. Your audience is not everyone. You do not want to reach everyone. You want to reach the right people. And then when I say you shouldn't, I mean you shouldn't try to beat the internet on quantity. You can beat the internet on quality. Never try to beat the internet on quantity. You could have a marketing budget of $10 million and you would still not even reach a tiny fraction of the people that are online every day. And that should not be your goal. So please ignore this. <laughs> I just wanted to put it up there to prove a point. So how can you reach your specific tribe of people, your community? You can use evocative language. And Rachel shared a ton of examples. I'm gonna share some examples as well. This is Plumber, Youth Promise, they used to be Plumber Home for Boys, a foster care agency. This email's from 2015, and I still read it. Who would come to my funeral? That was the subject line. It's the, it's un, the universal themes of loneliness and thinking that we're not loved, the fear of not being loved. Um, it's playing on these universal themes. They do fantastic storytelling, tiny organization. Amira, again, the time I almost died in Honduras. You're gonna Google that because you're gonna wanna read that blog. 
It's really, it grabs your attention. It has that hook that we need, it piques curiosity. This is a story of a woman. It starts out, when I first met my caseworker, I was on suicide watch at Metro State Prison. Starting out with that hook, every piece of communication, especially on digital channels. Another way to evoke emotion, but also to grab attention and make ideas a little bit more accessible is to use metaphor, one of the absolute most incredible orders of our entire time, of course, Martin Luther King Jr., he used metaphor in amazing ways. So in his I Have a Dream speech, this is a fantastic example, he said, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. And see it in your brain. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Study his speeches for the use of metaphor because it is provocative. It helps us memorize, it helps us remember, but it also helps paint a picture in our mind of these kind of abstract concepts like justice and equality. So what you don't want to do when you're collecting these stories, you don't want to say to someone, tell me your story. Because oftentimes we don't think we have interesting stories to tell. <laughs> we don't think that anyone would want to benefit or would benefit from our stories. So make sure you're asking leading questions. Make sure you're asking about emotion rather than what happened. You're saying, how did that make you feel? How did we make you feel? And always, you know, in ensuring people that, that you will be ethical in capturing their story. Questions you want to ask. What lesson does this story teach? Why this story for this particular time? Is it relevant? Is it urgent? And then when talking about donor segmentation, what audience are you telling the story to? A marketing audience is very different from a fundraising audience. A first-time donor is very different from a long-time donor. And I won't belabor that because I know we talked a lot about it previously. But what greater purpose does this story serve? And then you can also give your stories what I call the Aristotle test. So Aristotle is probably one of the first people to talk about marketing. So he was talking about persuasion. He wrote a lot about persuasion. How do we persuade people? But that's what we do as marketers, right? We're in the business of persuasion. He said that every piece of communication should have ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos is credibility. That's why um, Mark read my bio before I came out here. Right? That's why you looked me up on the app, or we might have talked. I mean, that's establishing credibility that I know what I'm talking about. So when you're picking your, your compelling character, they have, to have some, they have to have credibility. Also, logos, logic. That's the data piece. That's the, this is a problem. This is something that's happening, and this is something that we're capable of solving. But nothing can be done without pathos, which is the emotion. So make sure when you're telling your stories, you're crafting your communications, that it passes the Aristotle test. OK, so now we're going to talk about different methods and different platforms to, to spread our stories. And a fantastic quote is from Andy Goodman of the Goodman Center. Your stories are the gold, and you mold them depending on where you want to tell them. So obviously, the way you tell a story at your $200 a plate gala is different than the way you might tell a story on Instagram. So two very frequent questions that I get in my consulting work and all my work with my online courses, Julia, which platforms should we focus on and how much time is it going to take? Who, who wants to know the answer to those questions? OK, and you know I'm going to trick you because I'm going to say. Nothing, no, I'm, I am going to trick you. Well, really, it depends. So pretend that you're in a grocery store, and I walk up to you, and I'm a complete stranger, and I say to you, you know, where should I buy a house? And also, um, how much time is it going to take to buy a house? You would say, oh, I need to ask 50 questions before that. Do you have kids? Do you like the ocean? Do you like freezing cold weather? Then move to Boston, which is where I live. Um, do you like a lot of snow? So when you ask me which platforms, 
I have to say, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know your goals, your audience, your capacity, what you're trying to accomplish, the kind of story that you're telling. So you need to figure out where you're going, your destination on your GPS before you can figure out the roadmap to get there. And as to how much time it's going to take, that is the same answer. It takes as much time as it takes. So when I talk about digital storytelling and I'm gonna show you some platforms to use, I'm not saying use all the platforms. I'm not saying you have to do all the things. I'm not saying you're gonna fail if you don't use Instagram. You know, you're gonna fail if you don't use Facebook. I'm not saying that. My job is to give you the information to make an educated decision about which platforms you may or may not wanna pursue. Just remember this quote when asking yourself, where should we be online? How much time should we be spending? Your stories are the gold. The message is more important than the medium. This is the United Way of North Dakota, and they still do a print annual report. They call it their storybook. They put it in a PDF online. Print may or may not be the right option for you. It's a fantastic channel. But if you're doing something in print, you should definitely be putting it online. Use your website. Your website is your most important piece of marketing and fundraising collateral infinitely more important than social media. Social media, we are renters. We are sharecroppers on social media. We don't control anything about the platforms. They continually pull the rug out from under us. They continually move the cheese, right? So your website, you control. You control. Collecting stories of changed lives. Denver Rescue Mission is another fantastic organization. Does great work. They tell stories of changed lives on their website. They have faces, they have identifying, they do have identifying details, but it's always permission based. Embed video on your website. Embed video on your thank you for donating page. So we talked about embedding video in your thank you email, but when I make a donation to you, what comes up on your website? There should be a story. It should, you should be eliminating donor's remorse. When I push that donate button and then I say, oh my gosh, I don't have that $25 a month, I, I shouldn't have done that. If I see a video, if I hear a story right after that, I'm much less likely to want to move on. You know, I'm much less likely to have that remorseful feeling. Bright photos, eye-catching photos. This is Pine Street Inn where I live. Quotes, they all tell a story. They're all breadcrumbs that connect the dots. St. Jude's, we talked a lot about St. Jude's. They do really great work. They send a weekly patient story. So it does one, I know what to expect every week, which Stephen said was a huge piece of retaining donors. And secondly, I just get a little like dopamine rush every week. Very simple, picture and a story. Amira, same thing, picture and a story. They write emails that sound like they're coming from a friend the tone, the stories that they tell in their emails. You have to think about less is more. That 50 column, huge graphically designed email from Constant Contact, no. It's not gonna get opened. Tell stories using every channel at your disposal. You can tell stories on Twitter. Great visual, great quote. There you go, there's your story. Mercy Ships does a fantastic job they usually don't have even a call to action because when you're telling a story on social media, unless you're asking for a donation, the call to action is implicit. It's, there's retweet, or on Facebook it's share, like, and comment. There's already calls to action. So you do not have to have an explicit call to action on every story that you tell. This is Brandon, this is one of my favorites. What I love about Brandon, I actually have followed him on Instagram for several years and feel like I know him the sto from the story portraits. He provides context. So he writes these long descriptive captions which now really tend to work well on Instagram. Something else that you need to know is that it's not enough to have an overarching digital strategy. You have to have an individual strategy for each channel because what works on Instagram is clearly that caption is not gonna work on Twitter you know, what works on one channel is not necessarily going to translate over. You can repurpose, certainly, 
but you cannot just rehash, regurgitate, and cut and paste and automate. Instagram stories is a fantastic place to experiment, to go behind the scenes, to be raw, to be authentic, to do all that fun stuff that you don't think you can do, that you don't want living on your social media feeds forever. These are all platforms at your disposal that will help you tell your story, which really just means help you build your community, get people into the kitchen behind the scenes. It's also Instagram stories. I want to encourage you to think about the channels at your disposal, what works, and what you could maybe implement. And think about creating different individual strategies for each channel. But I firmly believe that we have a responsibility to tell our stories on as many channels as possible. We have a responsibility and a mandate to reach our donors, to reach our supporters where they are within reason. <laughs> but our stories make our ideas and our mission and our vision a reality for our audience. It's just something I'm very passionate about. So ask yourself these four questions. Are you telling real stories or just pushing out messages on your digital channels? What new insights am I going to gain? Are your stories interesting? Do they pass the Aristotle test? Are they challenging assumptions in creative and engaging ways? If we're thoughtful and strategic, we can make the digital world a better place. And I just want to end with a very important and vital quote when we're doing storytelling. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So thank you so much.